Thank you, John. I want to suggest now that you really put on your thinking hat. I have a paper here that was written by a gentleman who has since passed away. He was a great Canadian. His name was Dr. Lawrence Rampell. And when I first moved back to Canada from the United States about eight years ago, Dr. Rampell was sitting right here where Mr. Kavuk, the great photographer, is sitting. And this man took more notes than anyone I had ever seen in a seminar. I honestly thought if I could have got a copy of his notes that I would have probably had a transcript of what I was saying. Now, I made up my mind I'd get to know him after the seminar was over. I wanted to know why he wanted to have all this written. And he introduced himself as Dr. Rampell. I asked him if he was a medical doctor. He said, no. And I said, are you a dentist? He said, no. And I said, are you a chiropractor? He said, no. I said, you want to play 20 questions? And he laughed, you know. And he said, no, he had a doctorate's degree in thinking. Now, do you know, he had the only doctorate's degree in thinking that had ever, up till that time, come out of the University of Toronto. It took him 11 years to get it. Every time he went to go down a road, somebody put a block up in front of him and say, no one has a doctorate's degree in thinking. Now, that's rather odd, especially when you consider that thinking is the highest function of which a human being is capable, and all the great leaders all down through history have been in complete and unanimous agreement that you and I become what we think about. Now, play with that for a moment. It's a subject that is not taught in school. It's the highest function of which we're capable. And every great leader that has ever lived all told us that you and I become what we think about most of the time. Dr. Rampell wrote a paper, Tools for Teaching Thinking. He said, thinking is a skill which can be learned just as we learn skills such as typing and playing the piano. Now, he said, few public schools offer courses devoted expressly to teaching thinking. Rather, we are expected to learn and teach thinking as a byproduct of learning mathematics, reading, science, history, trade, and so forth. And he said, we do, in fact, learn a lot about thinking in this way. The trouble is, we learn our thinking skills in bits and pieces, and we never put it together as an overall picture. If asked to describe what all is required in order to think effectively, most people would be at a loss to give a complete account. Thus, we are unable to assess our own thinking skills or systematically teach the skill of thinking to others. Now, consider this for a moment. When you think, you think in pictures. Check it out. I'm going to suggest that you think of the home you live in, and as you do, realize that an image of your home comes on to the screen of your mind. It's almost as if there's a screen running right through the center of our head, and the second we think of our home, the picture of the home comes on to the screen of our mind. Now I want to suggest that you think of your automobile. And the second you think of your automobile, the picture of the home is gone, and the picture of the automobile is there. Think of your kitchen, your backyard. Think of where you work or go to school, and bang, 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 just like that, the picture changes. We literally think in pictures. Now I'm going to suggest that you think of your mind. Now when most people think of their mind, they get an image of the brain. How many thought of the brain? Quite a few hands going up. And yet you know the brain is not the mind any more than the fingernail is. And paradoxically, the fingernail and the brain is the mind. You see, mind is an activity, and body is the manifestation of that activity. And we're going to find out as we go along through the morning and this afternoon that the body is really nothing but an instrument of the mind. Now, your brain is comprised of hundreds of thousands of cells. Into these cells, we impregnate pictures or images. And as we think, we activate that particular group of brain cells, and the picture that's in them flashes on the screen of the mind. Now, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Flip over onto page five in your exercise book. At the top of the page, it's talking about me and money. 
Now, when you think of yourself and you think of money, what kind of a picture do you get? You know, the vast majority of people get a picture of, pro of poverty. And what we want to do is take and build cells of recognition in your brain for prosperity. So we're talking about me and money. That's you and your money. Now we say the program was written in the sincere hope that it would lead you. And that's all we could do is lead you. It's like Dr. Billy B. Sharp in Chicago. He said, a person will not believe something until they discover it for themselves. So we just actually want to lead you to this new awareness. Well, we want to lead you to the many discoveries that lie within you. And we're going to do that through the repetition of prosperous ideas. What we're going to do is tell you one thing 10,000 times and 10,000 different ways. And we're going to cause pictures to fly on the screen of your mind until you get a clear picture of greatness and prosperity locked up within you, because that's what they're, regardless of whether you understand that or not at this point. Now, we're suggesting that you start to see money. Whenever you think of money, see this stuff as an obedient, diligent servant. You're the master, it's the servant. And don't ever get that equation reversed, or you're going to find yourself in very, very deep trouble. You can use this to provide service far beyond your own physical presence. If you and I had no money, we'd still be able to provide service, but the service that we provided would be confined to our physical presence at any given place or any given time. However, if we had some money, we could provide that service far beyond our own physical presence. So let's make certain that we get that programmed into those cells properly. Now you come down a little further, we're going to say here that lack and limitation can only exist when we make room for them in our mind. But prosperity consciousness knows no lack and it knows no limitation. Now, I want to suggest that you resolve to just completely take the lid off your marvelous mind. Just blow it away. And let the greatness start to flow around in there. Now, flip over to the next page. When we start thinking about money, and we start thinking about ourselves, as I suggested, we get images on the screen of our mind. Now, on page six, we say throughout your entire Born Rich seminar, your attention is directed at the importance of your mind. The type of thoughts and ideas which occupy your consciousness are of paramount importance in developing prosperity in your life. Your mind is either in an orderly or a confused state. Order must prevail. John mentioned that a little, or, a little earlier. Order and movement are what necessary. Well, we start with the order. So we say order must prevail in your mind if you ever hope to see it manifest in your material world. Now, you want order in your material world. That means meaningful relationships. That means prosperity and growth in our business. It could mean all kinds of things that are good, but they all have to start in here. Everything starts in our mind. Well, if we're going to have order in our mind, we must have an image of our mind, and most people don't have. So what we're going to do as we go through the seminar is build brain cells. Now, that may sound a little strange to some of you. You may be sitting there and thinking, well, this is ridiculous. How can I build brain cells sitting watching this box? Well, I can assure you that you can, and I'm going to convince you very shortly that you're able to. Now, what I'm going to do I'm going to use different examples as we go through this seminar. And each one of these examples are real, live examples, every one of them. This is a letter that I received on February the 18th, 1986. It came from Joanne White. She was the regional administrator to the vice president of sales for the Metropolitan Insurance Company in Kansas City. Now, Joanne was in a seminar there in January of 1986. This letter is dated February of 86. And when Joanne came to the seminar in 1986, she told me a fascinating story. Now, apparently, she had come to a seminar that I conducted in Kansas City 10 years prior to this in 1976. Now, I didn't remember Joanne, nor did I remember her son, who she was telling me the story of. But when she told me what happened, I quickly related to it because it's happened many times and there's many situations that I do remember. 
Apparently, we had been doing seminars right across the country for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and a friend of hers in another area had been talking to her on the phone, who also worked for the same company, and this friend told her, if this seminar ever comes to Kansas City, make sure you go and take your son. Well, she took that person's advice and she came. She brought her 11-year-old son, Eric, who had been diagnosed as having learning disabilities. Now, keep your mind open here, folks, because this is real. It could happen, and it can happen to anyone. Someone had made a classical error, and someone, possibly in a position of authority, in fact, probably in a position of authority, and they told this lady and her husband that their 11-year-old son had learning disabilities and not to expect too much from him. So they didn't. Worse still, the little boy didn't expect much from himself. I told her to bring the little boy to the seminar, and we just built new brain cells, that that child could do anything he wanted. But this idea of learning disabilities was an error that someone had made, and they shouldn't believe it any longer. And I said, you bring him, have him sit right near the front, and I said, we'll give him a little special attention, and you'll just watch the change take place. Let me read you the letter. She's dear Bob. I want to take a moment to tell you how much I had gained from your seminar in Kansas City and how much I am continuing to gain from the use of your tapes. Now, at that time, all we had is audio tapes. Now, you can sit and you can watch this over and over and over again because there's going to be parts of it that'll seem a little confusing to you first time through. But as you play it over and over and over again, the confusion will leave and order is going to come to your mind. There's many times I'll take a book and I'll read the same paragraph over and over again. This book that I mentioned earlier of Napoleon Hills, I've been reading that for 27 years. Now, it's not such that I'm such a slow learner. It's just there's so much depth in the book. <laughs> My wife's sitting back there, and she's saying, no, it's not the depth. It's that you're a slow learner. <laughs> but, uh, and anyway, that, that's just her opinion. All right. <coughs> Now, she said, I listen to the tapes each time I get in my car, and I intend to continue to do so. And, of course, you've got the audio cassettes from the seminar as well, so you can just snap them into your car. Remember this. If you only drive 25,000 miles a year, you're spending 13, 40-hour weeks behind the wheel of that automobile, all of which your conscious mind is free to travel around and do anything it wants to do. Your body is programmed to drive the car. Well, she's Bob, I'm sure at times you ponder over the long-range effects of these seminars. Do you merely get people excited and then once you leave town, forget it? Well, she's, I attended your seminar when you were in Kansas City 10 years ago. I brought my 11-year-old son who was going through some trying times in school. He had been diagnosed as having learning disabilities and he was really struggling. Listen to this. He was certain he was a reject. What a terrible thought to be running through the little kid's mind. I'm a reject. Many adults running around with that thought in their mind. You could have been sitting with that thought in your mind. You might be sitting with that thought in your mind. I'm a reject. There's no such thing as rejects. God didn't make any rejects. But she says, I brought Eric to the seminars. He learned that you can do anything or be anything that you believe you can. He learned to set goals and to achieve the goals that he set. Listen to this for progress. I am very proud to tell you there was both an immediate and a long-range change in Eric's performance. In that same school year, his grades spiraled upwards and he became an honor student. Eric attended Bay State. He is an Eagle Scout. He was listed in Who's Who in American high schools. He was editor of his school paper. He qualified for scholarships, that's plural, he had his choice, for college. And at the present time, he's a junior at the University of Missouri, and he's on the dean's list. I feel a great deal of this can be credited to the fact that this 11-year-old boy learned he could do anything he believed he could, and he became a goal setter. Joanne concluded by saying, Bob, I just wanted to share this letter with you as I really do not know if we would be able to tell this success story if I had not brought Eric to this seminar. I'll always be grateful. I guess she will. And I guess Eric will too. And what was the big win? Was it the who's who in American high schools? Was it being editor of his school paper? Was it the honors that he accomplished that first year? 
Was it the college scholarships in college? I don't think so. I don't think any of those things were the big win. You know what the big win was? It was the one single idea that enabled him to do all these things. And one idea can cause you to make the progress this young boy made. We have a gentleman in our audience. I'm not quite sure where he is. He's a good friend of mine, Grant Sylvester. He's the president of Money Concepts for Canada. And uh, Grant Sylvester hired us to conduct these seminars way back in the 70s for a large company that he was a senior executive in. And right across the country, they had a 53% increase in sales. Now, that's hundreds of people. That's an enormous increase. I want you to think about that for a moment. Here's an idea that gave this little boy honors in schools, gave Grant's company a 50% increase in sales. So you see, I don't really care what you do. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's you that counts. And the more you understand you, the better your results you're going to get. Now, I'm going to run through a very quick idea, and it's very simple. Don't let the simplicity of this idea deceive you. What we're going to do is run through a concept and explain just how brain cells are built. Now, I'm going to ask someone from the audience, um, Nino, you're a good friend, come on up to the front here for a moment. All right, Nino. Wonderful, Bob. Give Nino a hand. Uh, and if you're sitting in your office or sitting at home, I want you to meet one of the best managers I know. Thank you. And I mean that sincerely, and I'm not just saying that to flatter Nino. I'm saying that because of the results that I see as people get. Uh, Nino was uh, kind enough to hire my son and daughter-in-law to go to work for them at the beginning of this year. And every month this year, they have earned somewhere between twenty dollars and $45,000 a month. Now, you don't do that if you haven't got a real good manager drawing the best out of you. Management is the development of people. It's not the direction of things. So Nino's a very good friend of mine. Now, Nino, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to do something. What I'd like you to do is hold out your hand like this. All right? Now, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Now, I would like you to look at that. I want you to see what that is. I don't want anybody to say anything. I'm going to put it in Nino's hand. You just close your eyes, Nino. I'm going to put this in your hand, and I want you to feel it. Close your hand and feel it. Now, Nino, tell me what that is. Feels like a piece of metal. Well, move your fingers around it and tell me what kind of a metal. What would you use that for? I would imagine to open the door. To open a door. <laughs> what do you call a piece of metal that opens the door? A key. This guy's a real ham, and he put him in front of a camera, and I'm telling you, he'll take it away. You guessed it right, Nino. You win one of our cassette tapes. That is a key. All right? Now, what happened there? Let's stop and think what happened. Nino has sensory factors. He can hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. And when your sensory factor touch comes in contact with something, a light message is sent through a nerve passageway in your body. It strikes a group of cells in your brain. Those brain cells are activated, and the picture that's in the cells flash on the screen of the mind. So although Nino was not looking at this, which is a sensory factor, and it'll work that way too, he was touching the key, and that triggered the image on the screen of his mind. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to show something to Nino, and I'm going to ask him what it is. Nino, I would like you to tell me what that is. A pin. A what? A pin. A pin. You think it is? Yes. You don't know what it is, do you? You're guessing now, aren't you? Now, you weren't guessing when you told me what that is. No. But when, you, when I asked you what this little metal object was, you are guessing. Is that correct? Correct. Now, Nino, what you're really saying is, I had cells of recognition when I touched this, but when I look at this, I have no cells of recognition. Now, we're going to build cells of recognition in your brain. I'm going to tell you what this is, and I'm going to do something with it, and as I do that, instantly, in a millisecond, cells will be built in your brain. That, Nino, has a little plunger on it. Now, as I hit that plunger, something's going to come out of here. Do you see that? That is a toothpick, Nino. <laughs> That's what your Aunt Marg gives you when you don't need anything, all right? Now, all right, now that is a toothpick. Now, that's no big deal, and you could miss the whole message here. 
But you see, Nino didn't know what that is. Do you know what he was saying? I don't have any cells of recognition in my brain. Now, when you go home, Nino, you can tell Rose that you built some brain cells this morning. She can love more of you. All right? You take more of her home. But that's exactly what that is. All right? And we just built some brain cells. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nino. Nino Spazzeri is, without question, one of the greatest real estate sales managers I've ever met. And you know, I told Brian something, and I'm going to tell you something. Whenever you go to do something, make certain that the people you surround yourself with are very successful. Carl Menninger one point in time pointed out that environment is more important than heredity. In other words, the people you find yourself surrounded by are more important to your success, your well-being, than what's built right into your genes at birth. And I suggested Brian go and see Nino. I told Leslie, go see Nino. Go to work for the man and listen to him and do what he tells you. And he'll draw the best out of you. And that's exactly what he's doing. Now, we're going to build some brain cells with respect to the mind. All right? And as we build these brain cells with respect to the mind, we're going to build a picture of our mind right in here. And then as we get that picture in here, we can start making headway and making some of the adjustments that John talked about in the proper use of the program. The points we just covered were simple but vitally important. And one of the most important points of all was the fact that you and I must have an image of our mind. Without an image, we have confusion. So that's very, very important. Now, I would like to introduce you to someone who I wrote about in Born Rich, Heinz and Donna Dawes. They came to the seminar and their circumstance was doom and gloom. We had bought this house in July of 1975 after being expropriated for the Pickering Airport fiasco north of the city. And almost every evening I would come home and I would be extremely negative, started to take out my frustrations on Donna because the mortgage payments and everything else was more than what we expected. And after you buy a home, you have to buy curtains and things like that. From 7.30, I believe, until 10.30 at night, I would probably say during those three hours my life changed totally. Because from um, an almost decision to having to sell this house, to three hours later, to having a target of having a Cadillac paid for in three weeks, that is a tremendous change. An important point here is that Heinz Dawes had been an insurance agent for 15 years. He had great information. He had heard many motivational speakers, but he was still at the financial point where he was going to have to sell his house. Heinz's problem was confusion. He did not have an image of his mind. And that's what made the difference. Unfortunately, a lot of those, uh, if you want to call them motivational speakers, are geared on a very narrow, specific point. And yes, it may give you an immediate shot of adrenaline, but very quickly wears down because you are not given the understanding of how it works. If I know how something works, as opposed to simply being told blindly as to how to do it, I have a different understanding. So that was the difference? Yes, the, the, the very easy, understandable way that Bob explains how the mind works, how you control the mind with your thoughts, and how the results are obtained. I got my Cadillac uh, in 22 days after I made that promise to myself. Now I'd like you to come with me and just the same as we were able to help Heinz and Donna and millions of others, I want to help you. Watch closely and we will create an image of your mind that you can work with for the rest of this program, for the rest of your life. We were talking about building brain cells and developing an image and placing it in these cells for our mind. So what we will have then are cells of recognition when we think of our mind, rather than drawing a blank or drawing on a picture of the brain, we actually have a workable image that we can start to use. Now, before we do that, 
Let me mention something here about a gentleman I heard speak way back in the early 70s. I was fortunate enough to be on a program in Chicago at a Human Resource Congress with a gentleman named Frank Goebel. Frank Goebel had been an aerospace engineer. He was the president of an aerospace company. And one day he was working on his budget and he realized that 65 cents out of every dollar revenue coming into that company was going back out of the company again to employees for either salaries or benefits. And he suddenly realized he knew virtually nothing about people. Here he was spending 65% of all the revenue on something he knew virtually nothing about. He said, I knew an awful lot about engineering, and I knew a fair amount about aerospace, but I knew very little about people. And so he said that he decided he would study some psychology, and fortunately for him, he ended up collaborating with Abraham Maslow. Now, Maslow made a break breakthrough, the like of which is maybe only made every few thousand years. He had come to the conclusion that you and I have infinite potential. He's written a paper, he went on, he left aerospace engineering, and he went on to start the Thomas Jefferson Research Center out in Pasadena. In a paper called The Productive Person, Goebel wrote, by nature, you and I are alike. By practice, we get wide apart. There's the difference in our results again. Now, he said the difference between the most dissimilar characters, between the real achievers and the non-achievers, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. He went on to quote William James, who concluded that we use a very small part of our real potential. And James said that most people live, whether physically, intellectually, or morally, in a very restricted circle of our potential being. We make use of a very small portion of our possible consciousness and of our soul's resources in general. Much like the person who out of their entire bodily organism would get into the habit of using and moving only their little finger. I want you to think for a moment, if you had a child and that child was laying perfectly still in its crib and the only part of its body that was ever able to move was its little finger. I'm quite certain that you would probably beg, you would borrow, and if you had to, you would steal to find out what's wrong with that child. But isn't it strange that a human being can stop growing mentally at a very early age and it can be virtually ignored? This is, without question, one of the most important subjects we can go to. I want to refer back to something Napoleon Hill wrote again that caught my attention when I first read the book. He pointed out in here, somewhere in your makeup, there lies sleeping the seed of achievement, which, if aroused and put into action, will carry you to heights such as you may have never hoped to attain. Do you know, as I think of this and as I read it now, I'm doing things today that 27 years ago, if anyone had suggested, I would have thought they were hallucinating. I um, take a look at my paycheck today. It's so completely different than it was when I first started to study this. In fact, the same people that used to pay me $4,000 a year are now paying me $4,000 an hour. And the only thing that's really changed is what's going on inside. Everything was already there. It's just a matter of learning how to use it. Now, he said, just as a master musician may cause the most beautiful strains of music to pour forth from the strings of a violin, so may you arouse the genius which lies asleep in your brain and cause it to drive you upwards towards any goal you may wish to achieve. Now, I'm going to put a couple of marks on the board, and I want you to really think seriously about this. You know, human organizations as we know them today are not going to last much longer. And that is because they have been, we have built them on a false premise. These organizations have been built on the premise that you and I are physical beings, and we're really not. We are spiritual beings living in physical bodies. And we've been gifted with something called an intellect. And by learning to use the intellectual factors in our personality, we can tap into the higher side of our own nature 
and improve anything in our physical world. But you know, to the average person, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And it may not make a whole lot of sense to you, as I just said it. But you're going to find, as we go along with this, and as we keep working with this idea, it's going to make an awful lot of sense to you. Now, I have found, when we start to study ourselves, there's only two points of reference we can go to. One is science, and the other is theology. There doesn't seem to be anywhere else to go. I have found that there are only six basic religions. Now, I spent quite a bit of time living and working in California. I think there's something like 4,000 religions in California, but everybody starts their own out there because there's tax breaks, you see. So, <laughs> but you're still going to find there's just six basic religions, and they all teach us essentially the same thing. They teach us that we are non-physical beings. They may use a different word, but the concept is the same. Do you know, it's a strange thing. Most people don't even know much about their own religion, and yet they say mine's right and all the rest are wrong, and they don't even know what the others are. I have found that every one of them has the truth in it. We are non-physical beings. See, the truth is something like the center of town. It really doesn't matter which side you approach it from. When you get there, you're in the same place. Now, the other area that we might want to look at is science. Science tells you your energy. As a matter of fact, a DuPont scientist many years ago said that the electrons and the atoms of your body contain a potential energy of more than 11 million kilowatt hours per pound. Do you know that there's enough potential energy locked up in that thing that you're sitting in that we call a body to light up this whole North American continent for nearly a week? And then you'll hear people say, I haven't got any energy. <laughs> what a ridiculous statement. That's all we are is a mass of energy. Do you know this thing you're living in vibrates? It glows. As a matter of fact, there is an aura of energy around your body. That is the cells leaving your body. Your body changes at the rate of about 50,000 cells per second. And as the as cells leave the body, new ones are created. And you know you can photograph the energy leaving the body. Semyon Kurlian, way back in the uh, early 30s, perfected a form of photography where he could take and photograph mass and the rays of energy coming from the body would penetrate the camera, penetrate the film, and you'd actually catch it on the, on the film. And you'd photograph the density and the color of it. I would imagine you're very familiar with this, are you, honey? That's right. And you know, as the image in a person's mind changes, the vibration of their body changes, and the density and the color of this energy changes, and changes dramatically. Do you know you've even got a mental faculty where you can start to feel that energy coming from a person, and you can determine the mood they're in very, very quickly. You can virtually read what's going on inside an individual. Now, as we study this, we're going to find that this side and this side is actually all hooked up. Think of this for a second. You see sitting here on the lectern a glass of water. Now, let's stop and think about this for a moment. We call that glass. It's actually energy. Because of the speed it's vibrating at, we call it glass. We call this water. That's what it is. It's water. But it's actually energy, too. As a matter of fact, the ring that's hitting it is energy, and the finger that the ring is on is energy. Everything's energy. Everything vibrates at a different speed. But stay with me here for a moment. What we're talking about here is energy. Now, while the energy is in the vibratory rate it's in, in that glass, we're going to call it water. And we call it water because it's vibrating at a physical or a corporeal state. If you were to add heat to that energy that we call water, you wouldn't call it water anymore. Then you would change the terminology that you would use. It would be the same energy but it would be moving faster in a higher speed of vibration. Then we would call it steam or vapor. And we would call the energy steam or vapor because it's not in a physical vibration. It's now moved into what we call an astral vibration. If we were to continue to add heat to that energy that we now call steam, you wouldn't call it steam any longer. You would call it air, ether, or gas. And that's because it's not in an astral vibration any longer. It's moved into now what we call an etheric vibration. But every level, it's the same energy. Now, as we take a look at this, we're going to let these lines represent levels of vibration. Or, as we more commonly refer to them, as frequencies. And you know, each frequency is hooked up to the one above and the one below. 
There's no line of demarcation where one stops and the other starts. See, every frequency, it's like the colors of a rainbow. As they fit together, there's no place where one color stops and the other starts. They're all joined together. Now, you're never going to see that with something you call sight. Sight is a physical sensory factor. You have to go to one of your higher faculties and you develop this through understanding. You start to understand. So do you see, the part of us that we cannot see and the part we can see is all the same. This is just the flip side of the coin of this. Spirit always manifests through its polar opposite. We have the ability right here to tap in to this great power that I choose to refer to as spirit, and we can tap in with an intellect, and we can cause this power to literally move into form into something we call an idea. That idea must literally move into something we refer to as results. You see, both science and theology clearly indicate nothing is created or destroyed. The only thing you can do is cause it to change. Now, this particular program is about prosperity. And when we think of prosperity, money plays a very large role. But of course, so do relationships, and so does the health of our body. But let's go back and think about money for a moment. Now, when you think about money, money is really an idea. You say, that's money. No, money is an idea. It's manifest on paper. Now, paper used to be wood. I remember when I was a little boy, I lived way up in Mishima Cotton Harbor. That's about three wigwams this side of the North Pole. It's a little north of King Garden, I think. But at any rate, when I lived up there, I'd watch them take these large logs out on flat cars on the railroad. And I remember people telling me that they were going to make paper out of it. And I thought, how do you make paper out of a tree? It didn't seem to make sense. Well, you alter the vibratory rate of the energy that's called wood, and pretty soon it's called paper. And then you put ink on it, and now we call it money. Now let's think about this money for a moment. If it can be neither created nor destroyed, it must already be here. If we can't destroy it, if heat will cause the energy that we call water to move into an etheric state, I would imagine heat would cause what we call money to move into an etheric state. And there it goes. Now where is it? You say it's gone, it's not gone, still here. You see, you'll never see it on the level it's on now with your physical sensory factor sight. But if you use your intellect and develop understanding, you'll know that it's still here. What we want to do is cause it to move into form. Now that's just about as bizarre as anything you'll ever hear <laughs> to some people's ears. But I'm going to tell you, it's just as true as anything you'll ever hear if you understand natural laws. And what I'm talking about is moving your mind into a higher vibration, developing a higher consciousness, and you can literally attract all the good that you want. You see, money is literally attracted to us, or it's repelled. Now, in the first 27 years of my life, I can assure you that I was not magnetized to that green energy. <laughs> Yet used to stay away from me, and now it just keeps coming to me. What did he say in this book? Right in the start of it, he said, when money starts coming, it'll come so fast and sure, so furious, it will literally make your head spin. Now, let's take these simple concepts that have deep meaning, and let's take this other board here and build a picture. One of our intellectual factors is imagination. Another one is reason. Now, with reason, we have the ability to think. John's going to be talking about that a little later on. With our imagination, we can tap into this infinite power and we can build beautiful pictures in our mind. Now, since no one has an image of the mind, we have to make one. It's like the little boy in school. He was sitting there doodling away, drawing a picture, and the teacher says, what are you doing, son? The kid says, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher says, nobody's ever seen God. Well, he says, wait till I finish the picture, you know. <laughs> I heard about a gentleman that was running a seminar in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was living and working in Chicago at the time. I, at the time, was prepared to go anywhere 
to try and find out why I changed. And Vancouver was not too far to go from Chicago. I always sort of laugh when I hear a pe person say, oh, if you hold one, one of these seminars in the east end of the city, I'll come, but I don't want to drive across the city. I'd walk across the continent if I thought I could get something that would help me understand me better, because I know it's my understanding of me that's going to determine the results that I get in my life, in my happiness, in my health, or in the area of wealth. Well, I flew off out to Vancouver, and I had heard many speakers. I had read many books. I had a ton of information running around my head, but I couldn't get it to fit. And I couldn't get it to fit for the same reason that some of you have never been able to get it to fit. You have no picture in the brain cells of the mind. Do you know there's many psychiatrists that have problems with their patients because they're not giving them an image to work with when they're working with their mind. I have taught this idea to psychiatrists. I had a psychiatrist, Marty Cohen, out in Century City, California, tell me that he made more headway with a patient in four visits than he had previously made in four years. And the simple reason for it is he gave them order. He gave them a picture to start to work with. Well, as soon as this gentleman got up and started to speak, he was a great big gentleman by comparison to me. He and I looked like Laurel and Hardy when we worked together. But at any rate, the second he got up to speak, I knew this man knew what he was talking about. And I'm going to tell you, I listened carefully. I went over when he was finished, and I asked him, I said, could I spend a couple of hours with you? And I'll never forget him looking at his watch and telling me that he was sorry. He didn't have a couple of hours. He had to go and catch a plane. Now, he said, I'd love to spend some time with you, but he said, I've got to catch a plane. And I said, well, I've got to catch a plane, too. I don't mean right now. And I said, where are you going? Or he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And he said, where do you live? And I said, Chicago. Well, he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I come out to hear you speak. He said, that's a long way. And I said, not for what I got. And so at any rate, I think he was impressed that I had traveled so far. He got his calendar out, and I got mine out. And he told me he was going to be in Toronto in a couple of weeks. I said, well, Toronto's only an hour from Chicago. It's just up and down. I'll come over if you'll meet with me. Well, the two of us sat down in the Skyline Hotel. And I'm going to tell you, Leland Val Van de Waal taught me as much in two hours. Well, I should say two days. No, it wasn't. It was two hours. We just spent a couple of days together. But everything fell into place in just a couple of hours. He taught me more in two hours than I had learned in nine years, studying faithfully every day. And he proceeded to tell me, he said, listen, Bob, he said, there's a difference between hearing and listening. He said, you hear with your ears, you listen with your emotions. Now, he said, as you sit here, he said, your mind could take a trip, but your body would stay right in front of me. Now, he said, you'd hear every word I'm saying but he said, you may not necessarily be listening. He said, if you're going to learn, you're going to have to listen. And you listen with your emotions. You've got to keep your mind with your body. No trips. Now, I said, if you do that, odds are pretty good you'll learn. And he says, there's a vast difference between learning and gathering information. He said, you see, all the way through school, we were encouraged to read, remember, and repeat. Read, remember, and repeat. And if you were able to do that fairly well, you were given the mortarboard of the sheepskin. And they said you had learned. Doesn't necessarily mean you've learned anything at all. You might have learned how to develop your memory, but that might have been the end of it. Now, I'm not saying no one learns doing that. Some do. But he said learning is not gathering information. Learning is when you consciously entertain an idea, you get emotionally involved in the idea, you step out and act on the idea, and you improve the results in some area of your life. Now, he said, this is the name of the game, Bob. He says it's results. Pretty good teacher a long time ago said, by their fruits, you'll know them. In other words, you can always tell a person's level of awareness by the results they're getting. If the results aren't there, they have no one to blame but themselves. For 27 years, I blamed everybody. I blamed my parents. I blamed my brother, my sister. I blamed my employers. I blamed the commanding officers I had in the Navy. It was never me, always them. They weren't doing enough for me. They weren't doing it right. The truth was, I wasn't facing up to the truth about me. I was never studying. I didn't know anything about myself. And as a result, the results indicated it. I was unhappy, sick, and broke. Now, he said, Bob, he said, you're going to have to alter some ideas in your mind. But he said, to do that, you're going to have to have a picture to work with. And he told me about a doctor in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Thruman Fleet. He started the concept therapy movement. He said he attempted to teach the healing arts, and he ran into a problem. He said, the medical profession 
that he was a part of were treating symptoms or effects. They were not treating causes. And he said, if you're ever going to enjoy health, you must treat the whole person. Now that's called holistic healing. How many of you are familiar with holistic healing? Quite a few. Well, that's where you heal the whole person. You see, you're a triune being. You live simultaneously on three planes of understanding. Every one of us are the same. Every one of us. The difference is in our results, but the same here. And that's where it all starts. And that's what we want to understand. When we walk into that office where the broad loom is up to our cheeks and there's a great big oak desk and a battery of secretaries, that person is not that much better than you are. I don't care how big their car is, how much money they've got in the bank. I don't care how pretty they are. They're no better than you, and they're no better than me. See, our problem is we have been living strictly with our sensory factors and never with our higher level of understanding. If a person's skin is a different color, we say they're different. If a person lives on the other side of an imaginary line, we say they're different. If a person speaks a different language, we say they're different. If a person is a different sex, we say they're different. Are they? No. They appear different to our sight. But when we develop a higher understanding, we're going to find out that we're all the same. And when we start to grasp that, then we can start to take action on the results we want. As we see a person getting better results, we can watch and see how they're getting them, and then we can do what, we're, what they're doing. Napoleon Hill says it pays to know how to buy knowledge. I'm going to tell you the best money you have ever invested is in this seminar. And I'm not saying that because I'm selling it or I'm done. And I'm not saying that because John's selling it or John's done. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that because I've studied thousands of seminars, and what we've done is take the very best out of them all and put them in this. When this was introduced to you early this morning, this was advertised as the most effective personal development seminar in the world today. It is, so far as I know. And I'm going to tell you, I've been to a lot of them. And it is because we give you a picture and then we show you how to change things. Well, Dr. Fleet said, if we're going to see health, we're going to have to give a person an image of the other side of their personality. And he said, since no one's ever seen the mind, I'm going to make a picture of the mind. Now, he said, let this represent the mind. Then he said, let this represent the thing that we've given all of our attention to now, up till now, the body. And he says, it's this thing here that moves into action and causes the results that we get. If we're going to change what we do, or if we're going to change our behavior, we're definitely going to have to change what's going on in here. If we're going to change what's going on in here, we're going to have to understand how it functions. And as he pointed out, there are two <coughs> sections to the mind, joined together, but different in their method of operation. And he referred to this as the conscious mind, and this as the subconscious mind. Now, if you look on page six of your action planner, you'll see that drawing. The day Leland Bell van der Waal drew that on the opposite side of a placemat in the coffee shop of the Skyline Hotel on Dixon Road in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I'm going to tell you my life changed. I've put that drawing on the board thousands and thousands of times, and periodically when I do, I hear people snicker. But I'm going to tell you, if they stick around, they don't snicker for long. Because what it does, it starts to trigger all kinds of light in their mind. You've heard, let there be light, let there be a higher consciousness, let there be an awareness. Well, what we've given you here is a picture to start working with. It's not my picture. It's not even Thruman Fleet's. It's our picture. The second you've got it in your mind, it's yours. No one can lay claim to something like this, but we can all use it. And we are all the same. I don't care how different you may appear to be to the person beside you, you and the person beside you are exactly the same. Now, it's understanding of how this functions that makes it different. Now, if you'll flip over in your exercise book, your action planner to page eight, and I would suggest that you follow this really closely. You could be sitting in your den or your family room and just watching this and the book stuck away somewhere. That'd be a terrible error. You'd be wasting your time. And you know, Time wasted, you never get back. Now, of course, you only have to pay once, you see. If you've wasted the past, you've already paid the price. You don't have to pay twice. There's one some consolation to it. But I would suggest you get the book out and follow me here. 
Now you'll notice on page eight and nine are six drawings there. It's actually just three different ideas, or it's one idea broken down into three different parts. And as you take a look on page eight, the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the body, there are some very key parts to that. On the top drawing on page eight, we say this is the part of your mind that thinks or reasons. This is where your free will lies. Viktor Frankl wrote a magnificent book called Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who spent the war years in a German concentration camp. And you know, I don't suppose anyone has ever been subjected to more abuse, intellectually and physically, than someone in one of those camps. I certainly couldn't even imagine it, even although he wrote it very well. But he pointed out, he said, regardless of how they chained us and abused us, they could never take control of our mind unless we chose to let them. He did not choose to let them. Viktor Frankl was a courageous man. He's lived to talk about it. He's lived to teach about it. And I'm going to tell you, he's a wise person. That's where your free will lies. You don't have to follow anybody else. We say the conscious mind can accept or reject any idea. Now, there is no person or circumstance that can cause you to think thoughts or ideas you do not choose. They are the most important lines that you might find in this entire program. Now, what I'm going to do is run over a few ideas. And as I do with each part, on page nine, jot some of them down. Not what I say, but what it means to you. Now, let's understand this right away. What I say, or what John says in this seminar, is not that important. What you see us put on the board is not that important. The different little props that we may use, they're not that important. What's important is what you think as a result of something we may say, or you may see on the board. That's what's important. There's something you want, and there might be one idea that we fire out that'll just trigger something in your mind and away you go. And you can do anything you want. I was talking to Raymond Aaron here earlier this morning. He's got a millionaire's club, and there's many of you in the audience, and I want to congratulate you. I think it's a great idea. He's teaching people how to become millionaires. I watch a lot of people laugh when they say, what? He's already made a hundred, a hundred people. Have, have developed a net worth of at least a million dollars just through one person's teaching. It's incredible, isn't it? It really is. That's not a crazy idea at all. You want to be a millionaire? You can be a millionaire. If you want to start your own business, you can start your own business. You can do anything you want. But clearly understand this. If you don't know how this works, you haven't got a snowball's chance in that hot place of doing it. <laughs>